Okay, so all throughout my life, I have been very involved with music, and my parents were always introducing me to new music all the time. From a young age, I knew that I was really good at hearing mistakes and critiquing them. I eventually joined orchestra and began playing the bass. In orchestra, I was unknowingly practicing ear training. I was always noticed little things about other people's performances that just stuck out to me in a bad way. And whenever I made comments about these, trying to help these people, I was always told I was too harsh and I was overthinking everything. And I felt really badly and I thought I was just being rude and mean. And maybe I was just picking at little details that didn't need to be picked at. But then I realized maybe I just have a better grasp on critical listening than they do. And it's really, it's changed my perception of how I listen to music and how I think of music because I realized like maybe I just have a really good ear and I could do something with this. So I thought I was, I wanted to be helpful. That's the reason I would critique all these people and, or think it in my head at least. And I realized I could make the most out of my talent and I should get a degree in music media production because of that. And that way with this degree, I could use this talent I have for hearing music and hearing these mistakes more easily than other people. And I could help others with it. Um, once I got to college, I figured out the easiest way to help me in the long run was to practice my ear training skills extensively. I knew that if I could listen to a song and be able to point out what I dislike about the music or what I like about the music, it would be able to help me in all my classes, like my recording classes, my um, even like my music theory classes or my sight singing classes. Um, I would just listen to music all the time and completely dissect it. I would listen to whole albums just in one sitting and just like completely go through it and pick out every little detail I notice. And even just anytime I casually listen to music, I would just like pay attention to every little aspect of it. Like I couldn't just listen to music in the background anymore. It was just always about picking apart all the little details and like really paying attention to what I'm listening to. And I would always just write down what I liked or what I disliked about it. And I had a really fun time doing this. And I realized that I was just writing music critiques and I really liked doing it. And I knew I could just make a career out of this. So the thing is, whenever I tried to read an actual published music critique on like the internet or in like a publication of any sort, I could always tell they weren't written by an actual musician. Oftentimes they were just written by journalists who may know a thing or two about music, but they haven't extensively studied it like I was doing. Um, the reviews, they would lack substance overall. They would usually just be filled with a bunch of adjectives and a bunch of big words to describe the general vibe of the song, but not talk about the actual song's quality. Um, for example, um, a Rolling Stone review of the song Young Blood by Five Seconds of Summer said that the song has a relentless, has relentless thumping rhythms. But like, what is that supposed to mean? That's all the review is, relentless thumping rhythms. And all I'm getting out of the review is that the song has a beat, but that doesn't say anything positive or negative about it. So is the song good? Is the song bad? I don't know. So that's what oftentimes music critiques by actual journalists always end up being. They just talk about in general what they hear, but they don't really say anything about the music or about the quality of it. It's just, in the end, it's just an observation, it's not a critique. So in general, a lot of music reviews lack substance and they're usually just a bunch of fancy words thrown together to describe a song in a long roundabout way and it always really bothered me. And for my capstone project, I decided I was going to pair together everything that I learned in the MMP program and write my own music reviews. I chose to write about popular songs that I found had notable points in the production and composition, whether they be good or bad. And I was gonna focus more about the production aspect, obviously. Um, then I went on explaining how these elements um, either enhanced or diminished the quality of the song. Also, because the average person does not know a lot of music production terminology, if they know any, I decided to give explanations of the terms whenever I use them. Um, it was really important for me to be thorough in this process and explain what I liked or disliked about the music, because music criticism is something that I'm really passionate about. It is something that I think most music critiques are pointless unless they actually explain what's good or bad or why or just point out flaws or great things also if something's bad about the song i like i also am writing what can be done to improve it 
based off of what I have learned in this program. So I need this website to publish my music reviews. Um, here's a screenshot I posted of the first page of it. This is the first thing you see when you go on my Weebly. Um, I chose to keep it very simple and only include the title of the project, analyzing and reviewing commercial music on there, as well as my contact information. Um, just in case anyone wants to contact me. Um, the next page is the about section. And this is obviously a much more compressed version of what I just explained. Um, I decided to explain that this was a school project on here. So if anybody outside of this sees this page, they will know that I'm not an actual journalist. So I'm not trying to be an actual legitimate journalist or trying to do something that will become big. Because right now, this is just for school. And there's still going to be mistakes in it. And so I explained that everything about my project. Um, the third page um, is where I'm going to, I posted all the reviews. And I'm not going to show this screenshot of that yet. But um, here's the list. I have this, this is the sidebar on the side of the page. And it has all the songs that I posted on there so far. And each song has like a link to it. And the way that this is organized is that if you look at the page, if you keep scrolling down, you'll see the songs that are at the top of the list first. So it's going to make it easier for you if you click the link you want. You can click the link instead of scrolling down all the way. And it's the top link. Emotions is the first one on there. So it makes it easier to access. So here's the songs I have. I have Emotions by Mar Mariah Carey, Say My Name by Destiny's Child, Paper Planes by M.I.A., Say You Catch Me by Beyonce, Some Hearts by Carrie Underwood, Hips Don't Lie by Shakira featuring Michael Sean. Look What You Made Me Do by Taylor Swift, Flightless Bird, American Mouth by Iron and Wine, and Mystery of Love by Sufjan Stevens. So I have all those so songs right now on this page, and it's kind of in a blog format. So here's a screenshot of the top of the page. So since Mystery of Love was the most recent song I wrote, published, it's at the very bottom of the reviewed songs. It's at the top of the page. And if you look, there's um, a Spotify link, so you can listen to the song on top of the um review so if you scroll down it cuts off but if you scroll down the review is posted right underneath it um and for the sake of my presentation i have posted all the reviews on this powerpoint and um i have posted all of them and i reformatted it to fix the powerpoint rather than just putting them um screenshots in because i thought that would look kind of sloppy and um so anybody watching this powerpoint can just like read along if they want so they don't zone out I just thought that would be the most efficient way to publish this. And yeah, it might be like a lot of words per slide, but I think it would just keep people's attention in more. Um, and also when I was choosing songs, I wanted to choose songs that people would know or be familiar with in general. Or, and I didn't want to choose a bunch of songs that sounded the same. I wanted there to be a little bit of diversity in the genre. Um, and so now I'm going to go through my reviews and I'm going to explain why I picked these songs. So the first one I wrote was Emotions by Mariah Carey. And I picked this song because the first thing I, when I was listening, I was just listening to this song and I noticed um, there's a lot of interesting EQing going on. And I thought that it was really, something really interesting to talk about. So that's why I picked the first song on here. So I'm gonna read the review out. And the reason I don't, I have these um, reviews organized a certain way on this PowerPoint, because um, if I run out of time, like I can just go off and, I have it the ones I want to cover first, placed first. So it's not in the exact order of how I posted them. Okay, so Emotions by Mariah Carey. I really like the EQing on it. Um, so Emotions is a 1991 R&B disco song written and recorded by Mariah Carey from her 1991 studio album, Emotions. The song is notorious for showcasing Carey's vocal range, upper vocal register, and whistle register. Throughout most of the song, she sings between a G3 and a G5. But the ending of this song features some of the highest notes in any of Carrie's music, including a C7 and an E7. These notes are three octaves above the middle C, C4, and are among the highest notes ever produced by singing voice to be recorded in music. The composition and production of this song are intended to showcase these high notes, but also makes this sound effortless. Part of this is done by having use of equalization or EQing. This is a step taken during the mixing process where the recorded audio is filtered to either cut or highlight certain frequencies. And just a side note here, this is like what I was saying. I want to explain the terms so people who don't know these terms will understand what I'm talking about. 
In emotions, many of the higher frequencies are being emphasized in multiple instrument tracks, as well as Carrie's vocals. This is especially noticeable in the guitar, piano, and snare drum tracks, which consistently play throughout the song. By EQing these tracks to emphasize the higher frequencies, it allows Harry, Harry's high pitched notes to stand out in the mix but not to feel too out of place. By emphasizing the higher frequencies, it also gives the illusion that the notes are even higher pitched than they actually are. To help showcase Carrie's vocal ability, the instrumentation is stripped down when she sings the whistle tones, which allows the listener to hear the notes more easily in the mix. Without the distraction of other instruments, I think that the composition and the production techniques used in the song are very clever. The song is clearly written to written and produced to show off Carrie's vocal range, vocal ability and range, and is very successful in doing so. The song remains one of her biggest hits of all time and deserves the success it achieved. Also, throughout at at one point in my um reviews, I do like to talk about like whether I think the song was fairly good or I think it was good, but this aspect was bad, or but um at the end of them I do give my general consensus. And here's where example I hear when I talk about how I think it deserved the success. Um my next review is very some hearts by Carrie Underwood. See, I wanted to mix it up. I didn't want to do entirely the same genre. So here I did a country song. Um oops, okay. Um some Hearts is a country pop song recorded by Carrie Underwood for her 2005 debut album of the same name. The song was originally released by Marshall Crenshaw in 1989 for his album Good Evening. The song includes lighthearted lyrics referring to an unexpected romance. Overall, the song is decent, but there is no emotional depth to it, but it is a fun song to listen and sing along to. The real notable thing about Some Hearts are the some sloppy moments in the song's productions. The mixing of a snare drum is unfortunate flaw in the mix. It could have easily be fixed with EQing. Whether EQing or equalization, unwanted pitches are manipulated out of recordings. In this song, the snare drum is ringing the pitch of B5, which is referred to as the overtone of the drum. Typically, the producer would want to eliminate this ringing pitch from the snare so that the note would not stick out in the mix. However, the producer does not do so in this recording. Therefore, the D5 pitch of the snare becomes very audible in this song. Another issue with some hearts is a clipping error near the end of the song. During the song's chorus, Underwood sings, some hearts just get lucky sometimes. In the break between the words lucky um, and sometimes oh, this is typo, um, it is audible where there was a track that was um, trimmed, clipped, and poorly sliced back, like, back together. Um, listening closely, it sounds like the original lyrics during this section where some hearts get lucky, lucky sometimes, with the repeat of the words lucky being sung as an echo. However, the track was clipped so that the repeated lucky was trimmed down to luck and the volume was lowered to try to hide it. And it creates an awkward, unnatural sounding cutoff of the word and a noticeable pickup in the music. Even though some hearts may be a fun song, the quality is just mediocre at that. Um, and then we move on to Chips Don't Lie. And the reason I picked this song is actually because um, I found out, like, I saw something on the internet. People were saying that they didn't like the production of the song. And I didn't, like, know why, because I always thought the song was fun. And um, so I listened to it, and I figured out, like, oh, yeah, there are some issues. And so that's what I talk about. Um, Hips Don't Lie is a 2006 Latin pop song written and recorded by Shakira featuring Wycliffe Jean. The song is the second single released from Shakira's 2005 studio album, Oral Fixation Volume 2. The song is notable for its fun, Latin infused lyrics and melody. While the sun song might be well composed, the overall production of the song is lacking. The main issue occurs with the EQing or equalization of the song. With the EQing process, frequencies can audibly be emphasized and diminished in the mix. Done correctly, this process will refine and mix and help clean up sloppy recorded tracks. With Hips Don't Lie, the EQing is its major flaw. Seemingly, all the tracks have too much EQing to them. Many of the instrument tracks and all of the vocal tracks audibly have a lot of higher frequencies cut out of them. This takes a lot of the life out of the music. It makes the tracks sound a lot more one-dimensional instead of full and rounded out like they should sound. Typically, producers emphasize the higher frequencies of the vocal tracks to add more air and presence to the mix. It's strange why the producer would cut out frequencies so much. Another small issue with this song is the use of the, 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 the distorted bass in the second half of the song. The bass does not well blend, blend well with the other instruments and feels very out of place. The rest of the instruments sounded 
lean line recorded but the bass is purposely distorted giving it a dirty sound this style of bass works in some pop music but it not in lamb pop music overall even though hips don't lie may be a fun upbeat song some aspects of effects of its production are not adequate. Okay, so the next song is Light Whispered American Mouth by Iron and Wine. And also in general, um, those reviews I just did were shorter ones, were some of the shorter ones. Some of them are longer and they take a couple of slides. And overall, I wanted to keep them similar in length or I wanted to at least do, I, at first I originally wanted to have them be about 300 words each, but then some of them I had more to talk about and some of them I was like, you know, 300 words is a stretch. I can get my points across in maybe like 200 and that's fine. I say what I need to say. Um, so this is an example of a longer one. Um, flightless and it's, oh wait. Flightless Bird American Mouth by Iron and Wine. Um, Flightless Bird American Mouth is a 2007 folk rock song written and recorded by singer songwriter Iron and Wine and is a track featured on the artist's studio album, The Shepherd's Dog. This song was popularized by its use in the 2008 film Twilight and also appeared on the film's accompanying soundtrack. Lyrically and melodically, Flightless Bird American Mouth is quite simple. The song's lyrics are slightly nonsensical and quirky and refer to finding a lost love. Instrumentation is very stripped down. The melody is very simple as well. The simple instrumentation and melody allow for the listener to focus on the lyrics and feel the overall warm, relaxed, romantic vibe of the song. Moving on to the song's production, the use of reverb on the vocal tracks is very good. The vocal tracks feature a good amount of reverb, which is which paired along with the singer's breathy, soft vocals, create a dreamy and ethereal feel to the music. Without the vocal reverb, the song would sound less refined and a lot less rounded out and full. Cool. In comparison, the version of this song on the Twilight soundtrack, because it is featured in that film, um, is mixed differently and has a lot less reverb. That mix does not have the same effect that the original version does on the Shepherd's album does. Um, the reverb is a simple tool that can change the whole vibe of the song. Wait. One issue with the production of song is the volume control. A recorded song should not have a wide range of vocal, a wide range of dynamics, but for some reason, flightless bird American mouth does. The difference between the volume at the beginning of the song and at the end of the song is very large, very large. Um, the first verse and chorus of the song is very quiet compared to the rest of the song, but the music is suddenly much louder at the second verse and remains that loud for the rest of the song. There's no reason that any song should have a drastic volume change like that. The volume levels should have stayed relatively constant throughout with a few tasteful changes to highlight and accentuate certain instruments when necessary. Overall, Flightless Bird American Elf by Iron and Mind is a very timeless and beautiful song. The melodic composition might be basic and simple, but it complements the lyrics very well. If the production of the song were improved, the song would have been better, but it's still fairly good the way it already is. And moving on, we do look what we made me do by Kalisa. And the reason I put this song is because I wanted to talk about songs that I just had an issue with overall and I didn't think were very good for multiple reasons. And I think this is the longest review. Um, and it was important for me to talk about songs that I thought were very well done and songs that were very poorly done. And um, this is just a really good example of a poorly done song in my opinion. Um, Look What You Made Me Do is also, oh yeah, before I get into it, also I too talk about the composition of this song a little bit more than I do in the other ones. Um, I did want to talk about the composition more so in some of these than the other ones. So this one is a good example of that. Okay. Look What You Made Me Do is a 2017 pop song written and recorded by Taylor Swift and released as the lead single for his sixth studio album, Reputation. The song was an attempt for Swift to try to change her image and sound. However, the direction she took with the song was such a misstep. The music that she was trying to put out was much too was too much for her singing voice to handle. The lyrics came off as immature and petty. One major issue with "Look What You Made Me Do" is the overall music and melody. The song um, has very heavy production and is not suitable song for Swift to be singing, as her voice is very thin and does not have much strength to it. Her voice cannot hold its own in this song like this. Many of the songs on Reputation do not blend well with Swift's singing voice. If a stronger, more trained singer were to sing them they would probably sound significantly better. 
The overall production of this album is very heavy and often overpowers her singing. Look What You Made Me Do is a prime example of this issue. The overall song, sound of this song is way too much for Swift to handle, and the producer should have opted for a lighter, toned down mix that would allow her to hold her own. Referring to the melody of the song, there is so much rising action in the verse in the bridge that leads nowhere. The chorus is incredibly weak and monotonous. Typically in pop music, the, the verses are relatively simple and monotonous, and the pre-chorus and we are more the pre-chorus is more melodic than the verses, and the chorus is the most melodic part of the song. However, Swiss changes that formula with Look What You Made Me Do. In this song, the chorus is the most monotonous part of the song, even less interesting than the verses. There's so much buildup in this song just to be let down gently by a boring, monotonous chorus. The worst part is the chorus is literally just a line, look what you made me do, repeated eight times in a row without any variation in pitch and melody. Another major flaw with Look What You Made Me Do is that in, it was an attempt for Swift to be dramatic and show off that no one in the world should be messing with her. However, the lyrics of this song show a different side to her, making her look like an immature child throwing a fit. The pre-chorus after the second verse is quite catastrophic. Swift attempts to be confident with the lyrics, mocking people that have done her wrong, but comes off as rude and immature, saying, the world moves on, another day, another drama. Drama. But not for me, not for me, all I think about is karma. It is a truly cringy lyric, it sounds like sounds relatable to petty high school drama. The worst part is Switch was 27 years old when this song was released, about 10 years beyond high school, yet she was still writing lyrics like that. <laughs> um, not only are the lyrics especially bad in the second three chorus, the production of that spot is horrendous. There are multiple voices being layered and singing the same line, but none of the voices are singing in tune, which create dissonances in the music. For some reason, the recorded takes where she sings with poor intonation somehow made it into the final mix. This is not an issue unique to this song, unfortunately. Throughout many of Swift's songs throughout her career, there, there are many audible moments where she is struggling to hold pitches, especially when it comes to large comes to longer notes. This song is just a clear instance where the producer did not try to fix her poor intonation. Look What You Made Me Do is one of the cringiest, poorly made pop songs of all time. Honestly, Swift should be embarrassed by it. It is very confusing how she, Swift can release a monstrosity that this song is, and the success of her career does not even flinch. The album reputation was still a commercial success, even though she kicked off this era with this horrible song. Um, that was really the only um, really bad review I wrote about a song, um, because I was really trying to focus on songs that I... Um, well, I was first, I was looking through songs that I liked initially, but I thought it would be really important to show a song that I hated, and I thought that would be a really good example of it. Um, so the next song is Paper Plants by M.I.A. So I chose this song because there, I, I really do, I think this is a fairly good song, but I chose this song for one particular reason, and it's a shorter review, but I thought it was important to talk about. Um, Paper Plants is a 2008 hip hop song written and recorded by MIA. Compositionally, the song is very unique with lyrics mocking the negative American perceptions of third world nations and immigrants. One interesting compositional aspect of the song is its use of samples and gunshots, of gunshots and cash register noises in the chorus being paired up with lyrics about robbery. This use of samples is a creative way to enhance the overall message of the song. The best elements of the song is the creativity and the cleverness of the composition. For the most part, the production of Paper Plants is fairly good. The tracks are balanced nicely, and there's a good use of reverb on many of the tracks, especially the vocal tracks that make the mix sound fuller. One notable issue with Paper Plants, however, is the sloppy trimming used to eliminate unnecessary, unusable tracks based at the end of each verse. When the transition of each verse of each verse to the chorus, the trimming is very noticeable. It is clear audible. It is clearly audible that there was more recorded audio on the vocal track, but it was trimmed off. However, it was not trimmed precisely because the next recorded notes are able to be heard at first split second after the verses and before the chorus. It sounds very much like a pop in the music. This could have been easily avoidable had the producer just trimmed the, cl the clips differently. They could have also used automation to lower the volume so that the unused tracks faded out. Because neither of these methods we use, the plots sound unclean. Um, oh yeah, for example, I didn't end this one with a good summary of the song, but I do talk about it in the sec in the first paragraph, basically summarizing the song. So there's a little bit of variation to how I'm writing these reviews overall. Um, Pray You Catch Me by Beyonce. Um, I was, when I was picking the song, I really wanted to do a song from Lemonade because I think that album is very, very 
very well done and like very cleverly written and i was just going through and i was trying to listen to which song really invoked something in me and like made me really think about the production the most that i thought i could write about the best and i do talk a little bit about multiple songs in this review but i especially talk about pray you catch me um so Pray You Catch Me is an R&B song written, by, written and recorded by Beyonce, appearing on her 2016 album Lemonade. The song is the first song on the album and functions perfectly as an introduction to the last of Lemonade. The overall theming of this album is very cohesive. The album follows Beyonce's emotional journey after learning about her husband's infidelity, with each song acting as a different chapter of the story. Pray You Catch Me is where the story begins, when Beyonce begins to suspect her husband of his unfaithfulness. Where You Catch Me has a limited instrumentation in be beginning with the bass notes and a layered vocal line, with more and more layers of different vocals being added as the song progresses. The vocal part of this section does not feature any actual lyrics, but just the voices singing vowel sounds. During the progression of this vocal introduction, a sound effects, sound effects of someone sniffing and creaking like could be heard. While seemingly unimportant, these effects give the song more imagery. There is a common trip in the media where a woman is detecting that her husband has been cheating with an, has been with another woman by smelling another woman's perfume on his clothes. The creaking wood sound effect could symbolize two different things. The wife sneaking through her husband's things as she's suspicious of him, and the husband sneaking around his wife trying to hide his, his affair. Obviously, these two sound effects could mean nothing, and they could just be added to give the song extra flair. Speculating their purpose might be overthinking the song, but with an album as clever and as well written as Lemonade, it feels wrong to dismiss these ideas that there's no purpose there. One especially interesting thing about Pray You Catch Me is the previously mentioned layering of the vocal line. This vocal section occurs at the beginning and ending of the song. To tie the rest of the album together, a snippet of this vocal section can also be heard at the end of a later track called Freedom. The only difference in the use of this section of the two songs is that in Pray You Can Catch Me, um, there are no actual lyrics during this part and just vowel song, and the voices are singing only vowel songs, but in Freedom, the voices sing the words, My Love. The ending of Freedom is a turning point for the album, and the inclusion of the snippet from Pray You Catch Me at the end of the song marks a turn in Beyonce's emotional journey, where she chooses to forgive her cheating husband. The use of the lyrics, My Love, at the end of Freedom is especially symbolic because the last line of Pray You Catch Me is, what are you doing, my love? Altogether, Pray You Catch Me is one of is one of the most is an incredibly effective as the first song of the album and truly connects to our, our overarching theme of lemonade. Okay, so the next song I am writing about, um, I think this might be the last one, I don't know, is Mystery Love by Sufjan Stevens. Um, I picked this one because um I noticed something about it that I really wanted to write about and also I wanted a little bit more diversity in the songs that I was picking and I wanted to pick some more like indie sounding songs. Um, so Mystery of Love is a 2017 folk song written and recorded by Sufjan Stevens. The song was written to be featured in the 2017 film Call Me By Your Name and is featured on the film's soundtrack. The lyrics of Mystery of Love are the true focal point of the song referring to a loving but ultimately doomed romantic relationship. Although this song is written to correlate with the events from the film it was written for, Stevens includes multiple details that allow it to stand on its own and not be joined at the hip with Holly by your name. The lyrics of Mystery of Love include details that separate the song from the film, including references to the city of Rogue River, Oregon, even though that is not relevant to the film in any way. By writing these lyrics, Stevens was successfully able to write a song that both fits in with the film, but can also be held on its own. The song's instrumentation and melody are very simple and do not overpower the lyrics. The production of these songs also allow for focus on the lyrics. The background instruments have a lot of compression on them, which not allowing them to ring out. Compression is a very common and useful process in music production, but the dynamic range of tracks are lessened. This could allow for more clarification to a track or even make the track sound less clear. With Mystery of Love, the instrument sounds are muddier and not crisp. To really stick out against the already dampened instrument tracks, the vocal track is EQ'd so that it sounds more crystal clear. The extra clear vocals and muddier backing instrument 
naturally allow for more emphasis on the lyrics being sung. Mystery of Love has great songwriting and production, and is a real sh it is a real shame that the song did not get more recognition than it did. While the song was nominated for many film awards, including the Academy Awards for Best Original Song, it was not recognized outside of the film Call Me By Your Name, which is a real shame because it is truly a beautiful song. In a perfect world, the song would have been a major contender for multiple Grammy Awards, but alas, its full nomination was for the category Song for Written for Visual Media. Oh, and I got in one more review, I think. Um, Say My Name by Destiny's Child. So when I picked this song, I was still really trying to like focus on different genres and like choose different songs from different genres, from different years and stuff, which was an idea I scrapped a few weeks ago because it was taking way too much time. And I was really trying to work on songs from the 90s, R&B songs from the 90s. And I chose this song. I thought it was really important. I initially just chose it because I thought it was a very popular song. It was very impactful. And it's still a song that people like today. And then I did notice some things I really thought were interesting about the song's production, which just gave me a lot to write about. Um, so my name is a 1999 R&B song recorded by Destiny's Child for their studio album, Writings on the Wall. This song features the vocals of Beyonce Knowles, Kelly Rowland, Latoya Luckett, and Latavia Roberson. To allow all of the voices to shine through the mix, the vocals are cleverly bland. Panning is the altering of the volume of recorded tracks so that the sound is more prominent on one side of the speaker than the other. It is a way of adding dimension to the music, functioning similarly to a surround sound system. In Say My Name, the vocal tracks are pounded to sound wide, avoiding a crowded and, and one-dimensional sounding mix. This also allows for a sense of separation when two vocal parts overlap. When there are, is one solo voice, the vocal, trend, the vocal track is panned closer toward the center, but when there are more than one singing at the, voice singing at the same part, the vocals are panned more and to the side. This technique also frames the solo vocalist, giving the listener a feel that they are in the center of the performance. Another notable thing about the production of Say My Name is the sampling of different sound effects. Throughout the song, the different and unusual sound effects are heard on the strong beats of the music. The sound effects sound very cartoony and comedic and are hidden in the mix. The inclusion of these sound effects are very no subtle, but make this it sound much more interesting if noticed. The problem with this song is the mixing through a specific vocal track. In Say My Name, there is a track with ad lib lyrics. This track is panned toward the center and prominently heard in the mix. However, this one track is not mixed to the same standard as the rest of the vocal tracks and sticks out in the wrong way. It sounds as if the track was mixed in a separate session by a different producer as the rest of the song. Since there is only one producer credited to this song, it does not make any sense by this issue. Of okay, so here are my takeaways from writing music reviews. Um, number one, I need to work on my writing skills because even like, I, I mean, some of you probably saw it like then there's like typos throughout and things just like don't flow as well as they could. And I mean, I'm not a writer, so I mean, I didn't expect everything to sound great. I was just trying to make it sound the best I can. And I think that if more people like who were interested in making music critiques, more musicians worked on their writing skills, like music and became critics um these critiques music critiques in general would be a lot better and a lot more filled with contents so i think i just need to work on my writing skills so i can really just make these sound really nice and sound like something you would see on a professional like in a professional publication um and it's actually really difficult to write these reviews because you really need to pick out what you think is the most important parts of the songs that you want to write about and you gotta you can't just highlight everything because in some of these songs i'd be like oh i like the way this is eq'd but like i have nothing else to write about like oh the vocals sound nice the eqing is really nice on the vocal but like it doesn't do any there's other things that are more important to talk about or it's just there's nothing else to write about besides it sounds nice so you have to kind of compress your ideas and make sure you have enough to talk about for a certain thing to really write about because otherwise it just turns into a mess and you might as well just write a list like a nice bullet pointed list of everything you like or dislike and that's not the way music critiques are they're they're written in essay format so that's one thing um also i think like 
the biggest thing for me was it was really difficult to get when I was writing this pro- project was it was so hard for me to just like be able to focus on what I was listening to. And I think that was a really hard thing. And I would just like sit there and I'd try to figure out, okay, something's wrong with this, but I can't think of what it is. And I can't pay attention enough to like notice there's an issue. So I think that it's just something for me in general, I need to pay more, like be better at focusing and really sit down and turn off my distraction. Um, but yeah, going off of that, it's just, it's really difficult because you you know something's wrong, but I don't know enough about music production to be able to say exactly like what it is. So I have to like research it. And then like, sometimes I was going in like doing my homework assignments with Pro Tools and I would like do things to experiment with the sound so I could try to relate it to something I heard in a mix. So I was using outside like other homework and classes to test things out to figure out really what was like what I was hearing and how to describe it well, which that was um, pretty um, time consuming, but I thought it was really effective. Um, And overall, I think that music critiques are like a really cool concept, but they need to be um, better executed. Um, I think that overall, it's just not cool to see a critique that all they have to say is that there's a beat to the song in a fancy roundabout way. And I think that um, people are reading these reviews because they want to know what's good or what's bad about the song. They don't want to just hear a bunch of fancy words to describe it. And overall, I think that I think I'm getting there. I think I'm working a lot better. I think I'm a lot better at writing critiques than I used to be because I was recently looking at a bunch of old music critiques I wrote a few years ago. And I don't really go into detail that much. And I kind of vaguely explain things. And I think I'm improving, but I think there's also a lot I can also improve on going on.